let's start by looking at the experiences. Max, you can put our 10 experiences. So really feel, you know, con uh, trying to bring this down to 10 experiences helps program directors because they can really focus on the most, most important experience. Besides the work, research, and volunteer experiences that were present previously, you can choose to have your experience as education training, which basically means uh, for IMGs, their postgraduate training, the residency training in their home country, other extracurricular activity and hobbies. So the hobbies section has now moved into the experiences section. Professional organizations, nothing much. Maybe if you had some kind of a leadership role, you can talk about that and our teaching and mentoring experience. So let's start looking at that. These other things like what is the participation frequency, the setting, these are optional. You can see there's no asterisk here. And you can choose you know, how frequently the participation was in that experience, what, what kind of setting that it was. And these are the primary focus areas, whether it's research, basic science, clinical science, community outreach, I'm not sure about customer service, healthcare, improving access, and so forth, and so many of them. And these are the key characteristics that can be said about each experience. Now, it's going to be very difficult to decide which key characteristic to choose, but do your very best. And I'm going to, again, share examples here with you. I feel programs might try to filter experiences based on this. So that's one way of looking from the program perspective. And I think they're trying to get more information in an easy-to-read format. So let's look at uh, the first example, clinical work experience. You know, of course, on the top, you're going to write um, the name of the organization, experience, of course. Now, the position title, this is where you have to be as specific as you can, intern, observer, extern, medical student, postgraduate work, whatever is the right title for you, choose that. And I highly suggest you include specialty in here. So, you, you know, for example, extern in cardiology, extern in hematology, oncology, that kind of a thing. Because you really want to give as much information from the titles as possible. Start date and it's all very clear. Now it's daily because, uh, you know, from this February 1 to February 28, every day you are doing this clinical experience. Of course, you know, weekends may or may not count, doesn't matter, but at least it was a daily, uh, you know, work that you were doing. Urban clinical translational science seemed to be the best option for this clinical work. And the reason why I chose empathy and compassion, we'll see next. So this is an example of a narrative in that paragraph. And this is what I propose you put when you're describing a clinical experience what setting it was, inpatient and outpatient setting under supervision of the name of the attending. This is the only place you can put their name. Perform, what did you do in this rotation? Perform history and physical exams, device treatment plan, presented four to six patients daily to, to the resident team, documented progress notes in EPIC EMR. So two things you'll note, I'd like to describe that you interacted with residents, fellows and attending it gives a sense to the program director that okay, there was some teaching, some education involved here. The EMR is super important nowadays. You really want to show familiarity with uh, the EMR, whether it's EPIC, eClinical Works, Cerner, definitely, definitely include that in your narrative. Third point, device differential diagnosis and strategies for evaluating hematological abnormalities, all this anemia, thrombocytopenia assisted in bone marrow biopsies under the supervision, presented, now uh, what was something unique this applicant did, presented a review of tumor lysis syndrome in a noon conference. And then uh, they gave a little bit more description, learned about stem cell transplant indications, complications, and so forth. So this is a very nice, very comprehensive narrative description of the what this experience involved. And, you remember the character count, 1,020 character count. I looked at it, I think this was about 700 characters. And you can see it's all presented in a bulleted form. So again, I discourage uh, applicants from writing this as a paragraph, write it in points, uh, just, like, just like what I've shared with you today. So if, again, you wanna look at what's a good format, what's that I recommend for writing the clinical work experience, 
four to six points. Again, try to keep it as concise as possible. We want to respect the time of the program director. This is a write the setting, outpatient, inpatient, name of the attending that you interacted with, just the attending or the resident team. What were the activities you performed? HNP, progress notes and EMR, rounds. Maybe you did night calls, so talk about it. What was your work? Medications, labs, radiological studies. Patients you saw is a bit optional. I'll leave that to you. Or if you were doing an observership where it's, you know, you're not really uh, directly interacting with patients, you can say directly observed, participated in daily rounds, and discussed management of hospitalized patients. Talk about something unique that you did. I presented a review of this. I presented a review of that. And education, I participated in the morning report or, or a noon conference. I think this is a very nice, comprehensive uh, you know, narrative that you can put when you're trying to describe the context, roles and responsibilities. Here's another one that I, uh, I'm gonna share, clinical work experience. So again, just like the last time, write the position title, include the specialty in the position title. And let's see here, this is more of critical thinking. This is another example. This is in cardiology. Performed history taking an exam of patients with diverse cardiac conditions in outpatient clinic with doctor so-and-so. This seems more like a, you know, a clinic rather than a university hospital. So I'd, it just says cardiology attending. Presented patient assessment and plan to the attendings, age and comorbidity screening, reconciliation, vaccination reviews, kind of whatever they did. Learn the indications and interpretation of this, 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 echocardiogram stress test, correlated these findings with the clinical presentation, recorded soap notes and e-clinical work. So this is exactly what I was saying. You have to include the EMR that you're familiar with. Conducted daily consultation visits. They did something unique. They presented a review of uh, the stock of SUBO cardiomyopathy to attending nurse practitioners and externs. That's kind of how a clinic is set up. And they assisted in EKG's stress test. So this is a very nice narrative, and um, I really don't think you should write more than what I've described in these two examples of clinical work experiences. Okay, now this is about an internship. The so clinical work experience, a lot of IMGs do internship in their home country. So you're going to write your name of your med school there as an organization, position, title, intern, um, clinical intern, if you want to write, that's fine. One year time period, sorry, the start date is wrong, but one year time period and daily recurring critical thinking and problem solving. That's kind of what typically done in um, internships. So this is uh, how a narrative for that one year internship would it look like. As part of the internship, um, I rotated in internal medicine, pediatrics, general surgery, anesthesia. This is, is the name of all the specialties, participated in all aspects of patient care, daily rounds, diagnostic planning, this and that monitored patients, wrote notes, admission orders, discharge summaries, morning rounds, handoff, and did these procedures. And again, this I feel is very comprehensive. Really nothing more than this needs to go in your era CV. So we saw two clinical experiences, US clinical experiences, one internship from med school. Let's look at the fourth experience, which is gonna be a research experience. So again, name of the hospital, research assistant. Will be nice if you can include specialty here. And again, daily recurring, this was something about quality improvement. So let's look at this. Now, this is shorter than the description of the clinical work experience. Assisted in research activities, GI and hepatology with attending, name of the attending, just in case a program director might recognize that the name of that, um, that attending, it's always nice to include their name. Performed literature search, analyzed the papers for the manuscripts, abstracted data, on research from the EMR EPIC. I mean, that's kind of how their study methods were. Collaborated with biostatistician for these projects um, and natural history of NAFLD, role of fibroscan, and the outcome presented two posters at this, uh, this conference, Digestive Disease Week and ACP Michigan. So the format for research work experience is as follows. Three to four points. This is, remember, I told you this is shorter than the clinical work experience. One line summary of the study design and the objective. What was your research role? That's the most important data collection, formal analysis, investigation, writing, review, editing, and so forth. 
if you're the first author of that research work, it deserves special mention. So definitely, definitely include that. Funding, if you did get that, and status of the research, whether it's presented, published, where exactly is that research work in the journey to getting published, you absolutely have to describe that. You don't have to talk about what were the findings of the research. You don't. There was one application I reviewed. They were talking about the p-values and everything, and that's absolutely not needed in a research work experience. Leave that for the interviews where they're going to ask. They might ask you, "What did you find in that research?" and then share it at the interview. Not here. The focus is on the research role, so try to make sure you describe it as best as possible. Like in that example. And uh, these are the terms that you can use in that description. All right, then this is another example you know, of another research assistant position and daily recurring public health, ingenuity and innovation. And this is because they took a little, little bit more you know, active role in this research. Participated in research projects studying the association between patient knowledge of A1C and the uh, diabetes control. That is their actual A1C level with Dr. So and so. And contribution. This was the questionnaire creation, literature search, interviewing, data collection, writing, abstract, and poster creation. So you can see the lead author in the abstract. Remember, I told you if you're the first author, take full credit for that. I include that. Abstract has been accepted for oral presentation at so and so clinical meeting. So this is a nice, concise description of the research work experience that you can put in the era CV. And kind of, again, the four points is very nicely written. What about volunteer experiences? Let's look at some. So this is an organization you're gonna have to, you know, uh, give the name. I just, uh, uh, I cannot give the uh, real name of the organization. So I just made that this one up and volunteer medical student and, you know, the focus area was community involvement, communication. So KLM is a volunteer run humanitarian assistance, disaster response, joint operation in the U.S. and, and Haiti. I participated in a seven-day mission and served as a medical interpreter uh, between French-speaking patients, American uh, English-speaking physicians, helped with triage, emergency medicine, cardiology. Again, you'll notice this is even shorter than the clinical and the research work experiences. Volunteer experience is just two to three points, no more than that. That's all you really have to do. Try to keep it as concise as possible. Here's another example. Volunteer experience, Rotary Club India, position organizer of the health camp. So th this is a very good title. You're kind of showing a leadership role in this way. And the date and everything, teamwork. So yeah, if you can use words like organized, led, those are strong words. So try to use that in, in the narrative. Organize the Rotary Club Diabetes Screening Health Camp in a village 20 miles from my med school. I led a team of med resident students and, and nurses and arranged transport and supplies. This team screened the local participants for diabetes, hypertension, and provided health advice on lifestyle changes, healthy diet, and primary care follow-up. Nicely written, short, concise, two to three points. That's all you need to do for volunteer experience. Now, another entry is a teaching or mentoring. If you had a teaching role, this is also a very nice experience to include in your personal statement, something like this applicant did. Medical school name, teaching mentoring, class vice president. So, and all this is there. So this is what this applicant did, served as student representative in faculty meetings to discuss educational improvements, introduced case-based learning and pathology, team activities, problem-based solving. Based on my efforts, our school's average score increased to second best. So this is very nice. They're trying to give an outcome that they were able to achieve through these efforts. I created a shared Google Drive containing recorded lectures and study notes in Q&A format for discussion. So again, nice and short, two to four points, it's good enough for uh, teaching and mentoring. All right, hobbies. This is a big one that needs to be included under experience. Previously, hobbies and extracurricular activity had a separate section, but now even AAMC is saying that include that here under experiences. Now, you can 
combine all the hobbies in one. You don't have to have like one entry for say music, one entry for dance, one for hiking. You can all just put it under one um, entry. So let's look at this medical school name, extracurricular activity. I just wrote medical student. I think that's good enough. Uh, you know, maybe a lot of these hobbies were done as a medical student and so forth, ingenuity and innovation. So let's look at this. Music, I've been playing guitar since high school and can play acoustic and electric guitar in rock and Indian pop music. I also play in local venues with a band and taught guitar to students, middle school students. Dance, I learned Indian dance, Bollywood Bhangra style in dance academy, participated in group and solo events. Hiking, I'm proud of my six mile hike on Snake Mountain, Massachusetts. Yoga, I practice hot yoga every week in a group. I'm a yoga teacher and conduct beginner classes for children. Three to four hobbies, I, I believe, is very good, is enough to include in your era CV. No more than that. Only describe hobbies that you're very passionate about, that you can really describe in detail if someone asks you. And do provide the details like what we saw in these examples, music. Okay, I play guitar, I play acoustic guitar, I play electric guitar. I, this is the kind of music I play and I do teach other students. It's a very good description. Don't write things like, uh, uh, I like music. And uh, that, that's, that, you have to give more details because you, know, you really wanna show that uh, this is something that's of interest to you. Program directors are very interested in hobbies because it gives a lot of human touch to, uh, to you. Uh, you know, it kind of, when we look at hobbies, it tells us about you as a person. What are your interests? It also tells us how you're gonna handle yourself, especially during residency, when there's so much you know, stress and burnout that have, that's described. So we need to make sure that you have hobbies that you can take care of yourself and you know, have emotional well-being. So absolutely, absolutely include one entry under hobbies and extracurricular activities in your era CV for 2024 and provide the details. So I don't want to read a CV that says, uh, you know, love to spend time with family and friends. No, that's not a hobby. Or I like, I like to read books. I like to watch Netflix. No, those are not hobbies. You have to show creative hobbies, hobbies that you're active in and describe, uh, describe in your uh, era CV. So those were the 10 experiences that you can include. Of course, you don't need to use all of them. You can choose nine, but I would highly suggest, you know, do your best, show that you're well-rounded, show as many kinds of experiences in your era CV. Now, the next section is called meaningful experience. What's a meaningful experience? And ERAS allows you to choose three of those 10 experiences to be included under meaningful experience. So when you write your paragraphs here, you're gonna have to like specify that this experience identifies with this experience. I'll show you examples. Now, meaningful experience means that you have to describe why it was meaningful to you. Why was it valuable to you? How did it help you? You don't have to write about what skills you learned. They've described it very well in the instructions. So don't focus on that. I'm going to show you some examples. Again, remember 300 characters. So if people on Twitter, they know it's like 280 characters. So it's like writing a tweet, really. Okay, meaningful experience. So this is for that first experience about hemong, or clinical experience. Observing Dr. Anderson's honest conversations with patients with terminal cancer about prognosis and goals of care taught me empathy and compassion. End of life meetings in the rotation helped me appreciate that the physician's efforts should be directed not just towards the quantity, but also quality of life. You can see only two sentences. This is kind of like two, maybe 280 characters or so. And that's why this experience was meaningful to this applicant. If you recall, I wrote that uh, the kind of characteristic was empathy and compassion, and it's because of this. Another meaningful experience. My, uh, my first US clinical rotation was a steep learning curve for me, both personally and professionally. In a week, I learned from students and residents to communicate effectively with patients and physicians, present on rounds and document in EMR. This experience made me proud of my adaptability. So again, we're talking about why that rotation was meaningful to this applicant. 
if you want some hints, what you could do is just go here. Let me show you where on how to write this and look at these key characteristics. You know, these are the characteristics that will uh, be highlighted in that meaningful experience. So for example, I talked about uh, was that empathy and compassion. And then the other one was this resilience and adaptability. That's what I'm trying to describe in this meaningful experience paragraph. Let's see, look at another example. I was the lead choreographer and spent many hours training my team in Bollywood dance in my third year of med school, working hard to practice every move in unison, taught me the importance of discipline and teamwork, whether we won or not. I remain in awe for camaraderie and team spirit. Again, 300 characters. And so you're describing why that experience from a hobby, you know, the hobby was uh, one of that uh, hobby was dance. So they're trying to describe why that was meaningful because of the leadership skills that they built uh, that they're describing here in this meaningful experience. So these are some examples of you know, three meaningful experiences that um, you can describe about those experiences. The reason why uh, it's important is because this paragraph, the first one about Dr. Anderson, that was linked to that first, first experience. Remember the one about the hemoc rotation? What happens is if you do, if you link it that way, that work experience goes. Uh, is the first thing that the program director will see. So having a meaningful experience, it prioritizes that experience that the program director is going to see. So that's why you have to be a bit careful about deciding which of those 10 experiences should be listed under meaningful experience and have narratives like this. Because those are the ones that will be much more clearly visible to the program director. And that's, again, it says that in the ERA's CV guide. Um, okay, now the next one is impactful experience. Yeah, so the impactful experience, that's another paragraph. Again, this is optional. The meaningful experiences are optional. The impactful experiences are optional. But I do feel we should take advantage of uh, this space to kind of talk about, uh, you know, our experiences. This one's all about challenges and hardships. So difficulties that you had throughout your life until the point when you apply for ERAs. And I'm gonna share some examples here. So the key is, key word is hardship, okay? Let's look at impactful experience number one. Let me move this to the side. In my third year of med school, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. As the only member of my family in medicine, I took it upon myself to face this challenge head on. I accompanied her to meetings with the surgeon and oncologist. Many options were presented that terrified her. I advocated for her to undergo mastectomy based on my literature search and curbsiding other mentors. Trying to show an active role here. I assured her that I will always be by her side in this fight. I also balanced my medical school studies and keep up with my classes and tests. Her successful recovery inspired me that being resilient in challenging times and getting support from peers and family are powerful enough to overcome any adversity. So again, one, it says 1,020 characters. So you have to kind of, uh, you have to write this as an essay really. And so this really talks about the difficulty and how this applicant handled that difficulty, really showing resilience and uh, had a very good outcome as a result of this, at the end of this challenge. Let's look at another example. Again, the key word is hardships, remember that. Impactful experience number two. As the first generation physician in my family, I encountered my own set of challenges and opportunities. Growing up in a rural village of Nepal limited the educational opportunities. My parents who were agricultural workers, appreciated the value of high quality education, supported my studies in a residential school far from home. I worked hard to achieve the scholarship from government of Nepal that covered my tuition fees in med school, I experienced tremendous personal growth in med school and pushed myself to get out of my comfort zone. In addition, the scholarship mandated two years of rural service that allowed me to give back to my community. And that continues to support my journey to US residency. So again, talking about the hardship that this applicant, that this applicant faced before starting this journey to US residency. 
All right, let's talk about the next part about, which is about geographic preferences. This is something again, that's new in uh, the eras for 2024. Now you can choose which geographic region you prefer to do your residency in, Pacific Mountain and so many out there. Now you can choose up to three geogra geographic regions. And whenever you do that, you have to give a description and I'll kind of share some examples there with you. You can choose to say, I do not have a division preference. Again, you'll have to give uh, write some nar narrative about that. Or you can skip the section completely and then no information will be provided to any program. So you have a couple of options. Let's look at some. So I want to explain to you what, uh, what the choices mean to the programs. So say the applicant is applying to a program in Philadelphia and Chicago, and they give these preferences, uh, Middle Atlantic uh, geographic preference, East North Central, which includes Illinois, okay? So if the, this is the geographic preference and these are the programs they apply to, the programs will get this message, the applicant prefers Middle Atlantic. So just the region that the Philadelphia program is in. And the Chicago program will get the message applicant prefers uh, East North Central, that is Illinois. They're not going to know about the other regions that the applicant may or may not have chosen. Say the applicant did apply to these two programs, but uh, you know preferred the Middle Atlantic and the West South Central, that is Texas. So here in this situation, the app, the program, the Philadelphia program will get the message, applicant prefers Middle E, Middle Atlantic, Chicago is not going to get any information. Okay, so the Chicago program will not know whether this is their geographic, geographic preference or not, it'll be blank. If this applicant just chooses, I don't have any preference, the Philadelphia program and the Chicago program will get the message that the applicant doesn't have a preference. If you leave it blank, no information is shared with the programs. So this is important to know what, what is the impact of the choices that you make under geographic preferences. Typically, you will choose these geographic preferences based on family, friends, familiarity, and I'll again share examples here with you. The reason why it's important to know about this in the last two years when the ERAS was doing all this research, they are saying that your chance of getting an interview in white is greater if the geographic preference that you give matches where the program physically is. So if you say, I want to be in um, the Philadelphia, what's the name of that? The Middle Atlantic. If you want to say that, uh, if you say, I want to go to the Middle Atlantic region and apply to a Philadelphia program, your chance of getting an interview in white goes up. And that's what exactly they say here as a conclusion. Applicants whose geographic preference aligned with the program location were more likely to be invited to interview than applicants whose geographic preferences did not align. So keep that in mind when you are deciding upon your geographic preferences. And here's the narrative that you can write for the geographic preferences. Now, this is someone applying to the New York region. My best friend from med school works in Long Island, New York. I prefer to be in the Northeast region to be available to visit her often for social support during residency. And this is very desirable. The reason why geographic preferences are being, you know, given so much weight nowadays is because they want to make sure you have social support, friends, family, because this is like the biggest uh, you know, negative predictor, the biggest deterrent to burnout. And so that's why programs want to make sure you have someone in the region, someone that you know. And this is a very desirable. Another re reason you can give for a geographic preference, I completed an observership in Worcester, Massachusetts. I prefer to be in the Northeast region as I'm familiar with the New England culture. I also love the four seasons, opportunities, outdoor activities, hiking and skiing. You can give that example. And this is a little bit uh, another example that you can give. Growing up, I often visited my grandparents in Atlanta, Georgia. I love the Southern hospitality, multicultural diversity, and warm climate the South Atlantic region has to offer to me and my wife. So um, 
it's okay. It's uh, you can certainly talk about this also if that's uh, you have a preference for that region. If you don't have any preference, you can write. You still have to write a narrative. You can write something as simple as this: I do not have any preference. I'm willing to relocate for the right opportunity. Again, I highly suggest you identify geographic preferences and give reasons like what I've shared here with you. You choose, I do not have geographic preference, kind of not the end of the world, but at least from the data that we have seen, you know, if you have a geographic preference, the worst things that's going to happen is a program that's outside the preference, uh, the region is not going to get any, you know, any, any information at all. Nothing, they're not going to hear, find out anything bad about your choices, about your preferences. And uh, giving the geographic preferences and applying to programs in that region, at least from the data that we're seeing, you, you do have an increased chance of getting an invite. There's another thing called setting preference. Not much has been written about this, but it's basically, you know, suburban, urban, rural uh, setting that you prefer. Now, I've given like these three regions, Pittsburgh, urban, Burlington, Vermont, suburban, and Greenville, Ohio, rural, okay? If you choose, if the applicant chooses suburban and urban, all the programs will get to know that this is your preference, suburban, urban, and so forth. Um, there is a preference for suburban slash urban, so you can certainly choose that. You don't have to be specific, just suburban and urban, okay? So I just want to let you know. I don't have any preference, so all the programs are going to know that you don't have a preference or you can be blank. Yeah, so, you know, don't apply to a rural program if you're choosing the suburban slash urban because this is, this is a message that they'll get. And of course, they're not going to invite you if they find out that's not your setting preference. Signaling. So, of course, this, start, this was present in the last, uh, you know, one or two years also. And uh, these are the, all the different number of signals that are allowed. How does signaling help? Again, this is data from ERAs, and it says that applicants who signal the program were more likely to be invited to interview than applicants who don't signal a program. Now, this is not universal. You know, if there's like a very popular program and they're getting too many signals, then, you know, it kind of uh, becomes very difficult to understand who is really interested or not. But in general, if you look at all the data, it does say that the signal is for a way of showing your interest. Now, the one thing that has changed from the previous era's application was that uh, I believe previously applicants were discouraged from sending a signal to places where they've done their rotation or you know, places that it's called a home program. I mean, if, if uh, it doesn't apply to IMGs, but for US seniors and graduates, uh, they were kind of discouraging them from choosing their own home institute uh, for signaling. But that's changed. Now they encourage you to specify a signal, those programs where you've done your rotation and show that interest. So signal a program. These are my recommendations where you really want to work. Don't signal a program just for fun and um, you know, just to kind of see if you have a chance, but you really don't want to go there. Don't waste your signals. They're very, very precious. Signal a program in your geographic preference. We saw some of the data that, um, you know, uh, signaling a program increases chance for interview. Having a geographic preference and applying to a program in that region increases your chance for interview. And having both, that is uh, signaling and geographic preference uh, to a program, you know, if they match with the program, that really increases your chance of interview invitation. So uh, take the most benefit of that. Signal a program where you have non-zero chance of matching. So if it's a very, you know, very research heavy institution and you don't have a research uh, experience, or if it's in a, uh, you know, if it's a, a very uh, a kind of a program, which is a very top-notch program, very competitive program, uh, you know, maybe with very few IMGs or no IMGs, then see, try to see, really decide if you have any chance of matching there. If you have a zero chance of matching there, then don't waste your signal there. Signal a program where you had clinical and research experiences. That's exactly what I was talking about. Signal a program where you can confidently answer the program director 
why are you interested now in our program? Because they will definitely ask you that at the interview. So you need to have very good, very personalized, very clear reasons to say why you're interested in that program. All right, let's look at the rest of the era CV. And so here are a few other things I want to point out. Membership in honorary professional societies. Just write the name of the, the society that you belong to, that you have a membership in. Medical school awards. So the thing that you have to remember here is that when you're describing the award, mention the year that you received the award. Why did you receive it? And what was the denominator that is out of how many students in the class or you know in the contest did you get that award because then a medical school award then becomes more important once we have all that information so for example here gold medal for best outgoing student 2021 awarded for highest score and final mbbs year in a class of 150 medical students so that's very complete very easy to understand other awards and accomplishments, if you want to talk about, say, any scholarships, any awards you received after you started med school, that's what needs to be included here. Now, the tuition scholarship, yes, technically that was awarded before you started med school, but, you know, it's a, the goal is the, that tuition scholarship was intended for med school studies so it's okay to include that awarded full tuition scholarship by government of nepal to pursue mbbs or if you had taken any of those online courses say on coursera and so forth you can describe that here certification on preventing opioid abuse by coursera online cme 2023 okay now this one was your med school education training extended or interrupted this is a very tricky question and you know for IMGs this is a very uh, difficult question uh, to answer because you know some IMGs do extend out their med school training in order to pursue you know taking the USMLE tests or coming to the US for rotations and so forth now we need to be careful so we have to make absolutely sure that your situation warrants choosing yes and if you do choose yes, absolutely, absolutely provide an explanation. Never leave it blank if you're choosing yes, if you're saying that your med school education was extended or interrupted, because then the program director will think that you're hiding something and not being truthful. So first, look at your med school documents, you know, maybe the MSPE that describe these gaps, then you have to very clearly, you know, disclose them. Now, graduating from your med school, just a few months, maybe it's, you know, three months, four months, you know, and this is like a very subjective, uh, you know, opinion of mine. I really don't think that is uh, really extending your medical education training. I think that's all okay. And I'm sure you'll have very good reasons for that. So just be very careful about this. The bottom line is, you know, if you have taken the extra time for your USMLE or, you know, for doing these rotations, please, please do describe that. This question was kind of intended mainly for med students who had to, you know, take time off maybe because of a personal illness or, you know, if there was some problem with accreditation of your med school. For example, I had a med student who who was in one of the Caribbean med schools and that med school lost its accreditation. So that applicant had to transfer and so forth. And so that's what was described in that, you know, in that uh, reasoning. And, you know, for example, I had one applicant from Ukraine and uh, so he had to describe all. And so that applicant had to describe what happened as to the reason the med school education was extended. So do provide your explanations clearly as best as you can. All right, let's move on to research citations. So for journals that you have authored, write down your name, enter all author names, you know, they describe how to, you know, present those names, last name, comma, first, initial and middle initial. 
Now, the thing is, you know, if you have many authors, it's going to be a little bit difficult for the program director to find your name among the so many authors. So one strategy is to capitalize your name among the list of the authors. This way, it can be very easily read by the program director. Uh, some residency applicants even put an asterisk next to their name so that I can quickly find, you know, that that applicant. I can quickly find that applicant's name uh, in the list of authors. So keep that in mind. Publication name. Write the full name of the journal. Don't abbreviate because some may not be familiar with that journal. All this information is very clear. Now the other category is this one: peer-reviewed journal articles, abstracts other than published. Now, the first thing is you cannot list a paper if you have not submitted that to a journal. Uh, so your job is to be as accurate as possible on the date of submission. So on the date of submission, you know, that may be even like a day before uh, ERAS allows programs to download your application. You know, you can certainly describe the most current status if you've got it to the submission st uh, stage, if you got it to if you're able to submit that paper to a journal, even a day before ERAs, you can certainly write that the paper has been submitted. But otherwise, you know, if you're still drafting it, there's no real place for you to do describe that paper, maybe under research experience, but you can't really cite that paper here. Okay, then the other research category is the poster presentation. Now, the poster presentations refer to the posters that you presented at a national or an international conference, maybe even like within the med school. I think that's still very valid. But, you know, one question, at least among IMGs, is posters that were presented as a requirement of your community medicine, preventive and social medicine rotation. No, that's not really research poster presentations. So don't include that in your era CV. The non-peer-reviewed online publication, this is where you can write about any blogs or you know you might have written. I think that's still very valid. Anything that you may have published online related to clinical medicine, you can certainly describe it here. Don't overdo it. If you have written, if you have like 10, 20 blogs, just maybe the most three, four most pertinent, most important ones, just describe that. Okay, let's look at the last two sections, which is the work authorization and then the language. So the work authorization for many IMGs might be that they're not authorized to work in the US. So one question that I commonly get is, should I choose H1B versus J1? And you know, this is a very personal decision. If there is any reason that you absolutely do not want J1 visa, then don't uh, check the J-1 visa box. And if you are okay with either J-1 or H-1B visa, kind of mark it the way I've done it here, and that's perfectly fine. Now, the decision is gonna be yours if you want to give priority to the H-1B programs versus the J-1 programs, that's entirely your decision. The last section that I wanna talk about is language fluency. I had one applicant maybe about two years ago who chose the level of English fluency was good. And so please, please don't do that because you're going to get into trouble. No program wants an, an residency applicant who's not confident of their English communication skills. So at the very least, choose advanced or native when you're describing your English fluency. Please keep that in mind. And then, of course, you know, choose if you have any other language fluency. So talk about that and the descriptions are listed here with regards to whether you have basic knowledge, fair, good, advanced, functionally native. Now, the thing is, it's most useful if that second language, say whether it's Spanish, French, or you know Mandarin, if you have advanced or functionally native fluency, because then you can really interact with patients, but basic, fair, and good, almost always you're gonna to have to use some kind of an interpreter, an online interpreter or a person to help you communicate with a patient. But you know, 
nevertheless, whatever the situation is, make sure you're very truthful about your language fluency in the era of CD. Thank <laughs> you.